is Yo Sapnipathia and welcome to tf for Let's Talk. And today we have with us Barrett Leon, co-founder and CTO at Tarsal. Barrett, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. This is great. It's my pleasure to host you here. And this is the first time I talked to you. So I would love to know a bit about the company. What do you folks do? In the very basic sense of what we do is that we move, we move uh, security data. So, you know, uh, once upon a time, the enterprise, you know, had all kinds of sniffing infrastructure and very basic uh data collection needs and then that you know would go into like a sim or soar and it was kind of like a manageable stack and then all of a sudden over everybody started using cloud services and then out of, out of that cloud services started creating uh audit logs and each one of them does it in a different unique and weird way so uh, as a result uh you know companies either have to hire teams to write scripts and applications to collect all this log data or they use a service like ours. And we just simplify it and make everything pretty much a cl clickable uh, um, pipeline. So, and we do it specifically for security data. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just shocking like how simple it sounds and how difficult the actual practice of doing it uh, is. So uh, that's what we do on, a ba on, on kind of like a high level view. And how old is the company? Uh, the company is about two years old. Um, we went to market recently, uh, you know, this year. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, a seed funded startup. We're pretty well funded with about $7 million. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've got some great clients. They're happy and, and we're building and the team's actually really having a good time gelling together at the moment. So it's like, a, it's a good vibe startup. This is the way I'd put it. The reason I asked when how old is the company is also that, first of all, either what took you so long to start Arsel, or second is that uh, when you look at security, when you look at open source, it seems like now the early days, you know, security was an afterthought, some other problem. Now it feels like security is becoming a priority. It's moving developers pipeline. There's no longer an afterthought. The culture is being built. So what led you to create this company at this time? It really comes down to the fact that enterprises have change the way they do business. So they, they have services now instead of applications. So they, they've got like Office 365. Okay, well now you have Office 365 audit logs. Well, how do you collect those? How do you get those and make them operational? How do you get them from, from Microsoft's API into your security data stack? And how do you run uh, queries against that that comes up with like meaningful uh, event data or you know uh, actionable alerts? Uh, that that question is being solved now, and it's because the enterprise has changed. And you know, just it's incredible how many different data sources there are. There's hundreds, uh, all related to security data. So it, it's a hard problem to solve, and it's a new problem. And so that's kind of why now uh, this makes sense. Um, I've done I think five startups now. Uh, my earliest one was a company called Prolexic where we did DDoS defense and we were the first denial of service defense company. We sold that to Akamai and then I got into some other uh, interesting areas. So I, I love doing this kind of work where it's like kind of new and edgy and, uh, and it solves a problem that people, everyone has. What offerings you have? What is your open source story, your EVP story? Yeah, so that's a project that was kind of, uh, it started at a company called Notography, which is one of my other uh, companies I work, work with, I sit on the board. And what we decided to do is we, we looked at flow data. So there's an S flow, net flow, and VPC flow data. And we realized, you know, it, there's a certain point where it, it's, it's only useful to, cert, to a certain extent. And we needed to get into basically the replicate what or synthesize what it used to look like when you sniff the wire. When you sniff, sniffed an ethernet network or a network of some sort, you used to be able to get raw data that was unencrypted and you could do all kinds of you know detections against it and it was really useful so the idea was can we write an application that's lightweight open source and it connects into the linux kernel where in monitors function calls um, in the system that are pre-encrypted so the function calls like an nginx for example uh, when it's processing http requests before it goes through the open SSL process and gets encrypted, we could see that. We could pull that data out and we could make it a stream of that data. And that stream of data can then be you know, sent to uh, a collector and the collector then can do security work against it. So it's kind of like a new way of getting to the old data that people want uh, wanted to have. And we decided to do it open source because it, I think that would be the 
the greatest good for the group of you know security practitioners out there. There needed to be a new type of security data, and uh, we think this is it. And then the way it fits into Tarsal, since Tarsal is a big data movement company, um, and this creates lots of data, it just kind of fits in with kind of our theme. Uh, so open sourcing the the, the data generator, so to speak, uh, makes a lot of sense for us. What are the reason behind open sourcing Kflow? Well, if it was closed source, then it's just another agent, you know, and there's a lot of agent fatigue uh, out there. And I think people uh, want to contribute to it. So, you know, we've seen people, that what we've done is created uh, a modular based kind of uh, decoders. So you know, the first thing the, the project does is it decodes all the file system and network activity and puts that into a JSON stream and a message. And that data is, is really useful because then you can start to track how a file left an operating system and went onto the network. And you can do really interesting forensic work with that. Well, then we wrote a module to decode DNS, then another module that decodes HTTP. And we figured, you know, as we continue to write these modules that decode like uh, MySQL or even Splunk for that matter, um, other people will be interested in writing the decoders themselves. So yeah, and, and we're starting to see contributors actually coming into the project and doing it. So instead of having a closed source agent that you have to run and just trust us, it's gonna work. Now it's like you can actually be part of the project and, and manipulate it the way you want. And I think that's really powerful. How does Kflow work with eBPF? Yeah, so eBPF is a Linux kernel kind of API. And so the way folks used to do an agent that would actually tie into the kernel uh, would be through a kernel module. And that's a little dangerous because you're doing brain surgery with a computer. And if you do brain surgery, sometimes you slip and you cause you know some pretty serious damage. So with Linux, uh, these modules can become cumbersome, they can be dangerous, and then that also sometimes means you have to compile a custom kernel and all that kind of stuff is really messy. eBPF gives you an opportunity to kind of use a user space application um, and tie into all the kernel functionality. So it kind of opens up the whole world of the kernel. Kind of think of it as it, eBPF actually means extended Berkeley packet filter. And BPF, Berkeley packet filter, it's been around in uh, FreeBSD and the BSD 4.4 uh, family of, of Unix for a very long time. And when it came into Linux, they I think the brilliant part about the uh, eBPF project is they extended it instead of just looking at what's going on in the network adapter and the network stack. They're like, well, before the data goes to the network, it has to be generated by some program. And that program is running over here in the kernel. So if you want to sniff the kernel, this is like kind of the, the cool way of getting into it and kind of tweaking uh, your ability to kind of look into and spy into what the kernel is doing without destroying the kernel itself. So if my application Kflow crashes, nothing happens to the machine. The, the kernel doesn't panic, the machine doesn't halt, just the application has to restart. So it saves a lot of trouble and it gives a, it's a huge, huge uh, advantage to, to doing it this way than compared to other, you know, other ways. And that's what eBPF I think is very, very exciting for a lot of people because it's a, not only a very efficient way of getting it, but it's also safe uh, to the operation of the machine. So I think I think that's pretty cool. Now, if you look at the data that Kflow generates, how are companies, uh, you know, using that data creatively? You know, Kflow itself is just generating JSON messages embedded in UDP. So you have to kind of gather those messages from all of the machines that you're running. But when you start doing that, you can do things like malware detection. Uh, you can do ransomware tracking. You can do threat hunting, change management. Um, so all that data just becomes incredibly useful and actionable, and so it's kind of fun to see how people are tinkering and writing different scripts against different things because it's it's one of those uh, very rich data sources that just kind of uh, has all these different opportunities to dig through and, and uh, you know things that you can accomplish with it, uh, which makes it really fun. There's no one way to do it. These days, one of the hottest uh, buzzword is Gen AI LLMs. Uh, what kind of a scope of Gen AI is there for Tarsal Kflow security? Yeah, so we view ourselves as like 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 we said, like the data movement folks. What we've had our clients come to us and say, "Hey, we're starting to run large language models against our Snowflake data, just raw 
uh, raw security data. And we're running into problems because the language model can't really read the descriptors of what each field means. So we're working on things where we can actually make your security data large language model aware. So we can actually embed um, kind of description of descriptions of the various different um, fields that you're getting and speak directly to the language model. So basically just enriching your data to make it friendly to make the LLM work, which is pretty neat. So there's there's a lot of like data wrangling required to make large language models kind of efficient and function right, yeah, especially on this like really what looks like mundane security data, but it's actually quite quite rich. So we're doing that. What kind of things we can expect from Tarsal this year? This year, um, well, we just totally came up with a brand new architecture that scales, we think, into the petabyte per day range, which is really difficult to do. Uh, we've got clients that move you know, near a petabyte of data per day. So doing that efficiently and cost effectively is, is really kind of been our, uh, our core focus. And, the, and then beyond that, it's just these just incredible long tail of different data sources. And there's, there's, there's hundreds of them. So we're getting to be, the, our core competency is going to be making the best connectors to those data sources. And so, so then people don't have to think, they can just click things on and it functions. If something breaks in the pipeline, the pipeline repairs itself. So that's, that's really kind of the, the ultimate goal. Barrett, thank you so much for taking time out today. You know, talk to me about not only the company, but the whole larger ecosystem. And I look forward to chat with you folks again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was great.